Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Sheldrick, and I work for Reuters. The Fukushima nuclear crisis has placed a big question mark over the future of atomic power in Japan, as well as leading to the prolonged shutdown of all nuclear reactors in the country. The optimists thought that reactors would be up and running by now, but it's clear that there remain significant public opposition and oper operational risk to the reboot of the country's nuclear industry. We are very fortunate to have with us here today someone who can throw some light onto the challenges facing Japan's nuclear industry. Dr. Charles Chuck Casto is a former US atomic nuclear industry administrator, sorry, who represented Washington and Japan during the Fukushima nuclear catastrophe. In the aftermath of the disaster, Dr. Custo has also helped develop more rigorous safety standards in the, in the US industry. Dr. Custo will talk about his experiences on handling crisis management during the dark days of the crisis and provide us with insight on how Japan can beef up safety in the industry as it slowly more moves towards rebooting the sector. We'll have some brief remarks from Dr. Casto and then I'll open the floor to questioning. Before I hand over, I'd like to remind everyone to turn off their, or mute their mobile devices. Dr. Castro, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this one here. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> it's not a funeral. <laughs> okay, it, it's, a, it's a session. So, uh, well, thank you all. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for that introduction. And thank the FCCJ for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. And, and thank you for your time, taking the time. Uh, I'm very grateful for you to take your time out of your day uh, to stop by and, and listen uh, to, to my talk. Uh, as Aaron said, I was, I guess I was the, uh, I certainly was the lead of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, response, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission in Japan uh, immediately after the accident and, and unexpectedly stayed here for about a year. Uh, <laughs> I came for a couple of days, the next thing I know it was February of the next year. Um, so uh, spent a lot of time um, working with, the, uh, with Ambassador Ruse and the other U.S. officials and, and uh, leading the, uh, the U.S. government response in Japan uh, to provide support to the Japanese government and to help uh, uh, protect American citizens here, here in Japan. Sort of a twofold, twofold mission. Um, I, had, I had responded to a, a, a nuclear event uh, about a decade earlier in, in Hungary, and uh, so I had some background in responding to fuel accidents and releases to the public. And also, I was a, uh, an operator at a at a nuclear facility almost identical to Fukushima Daiichi, units uh, two through four, and had done some other work uh, on Capitol Hill and stuff, so I had some political abilities as well. So I uh, was chosen to, uh, when President Obama asked to expand Operation Tomodachi to include the nuclear accident, and I was asked to lead a team over here of experts uh, to come over and provide advice uh, to the ambassador it was, uh, I was sitting in obscurity in Atlanta when the accident happened and watching it from afar. I was actually working in the construction organization, so I wasn't in operations. And so I wasn't closely connected the first day or two. I was only merely watching it on television. And uh, with that, uh, before I knew it, in a couple of days, uh, my cell phone rang and, and said, uh, Can you have a passport? And I said, yeah, I have a passport. And they said, well, you need to go to Tokyo. And I had about three hours notice and and uh, flew to Tokyo to lead the American effort here. And I knew uh, immediately the severity of, of, of the accident. I had uh, people calling, even when I was, before I was notified, I had people calling me, friends calling me and relatives calling me and saying, hey, what's up with this accident in Japan? And I, and I said, well, you know, it, it'll be okay. They'll work it out. They'll get power back and they'll work it out. I, I was wrong. <laughs> and. Uh, and when some of my friends found out I was leading the U.S. government effort, they were like, you, Mr., uh, everything's going to be okay. You're going to lead the effort. So, uh, but I did. And I, I knew immediately how severe uh, things were for the worry for, the, for society. When I got on uh, uh, the airplane to come uh, over 
uh, the flight crew actually sought me out and pulled me up to first class, and which was great, I thought. And uh, but they spent hours, literally, the flight crew spent hours asking me about the nuclear accident and worried about flying into Japan and whether or not they, they were going to be exposed to radiation. And they were for hours we talked about it. So you could see immediately the concern of society uh, through, uh, around the world on the, on the event. So uh, it came to the embassy and immediately uh, it started a hectic, uh, hectic uh, work uh, trying, to, trying to understand the event and provide advice uh, to, the, to the Japanese government. And for, I think from a global perspective, I'll, let me start out a little bit broad and then I'll, I'll narrow down a little bit. You know, a, a crisis response of this magnitude uh, was, was really unprecedented for a first world nation to help another first world nation. Uh, we, we really, in a crisis like this, that was transboundary. You know, people worried around the world about it. It was really one of the f most uh, unique and severe uh, cases that we've had for, for uh, crisis response. And if we, if we look today at, at some of the issues with both Malaysia Airlines, Ebola, uh, this, and we see, you know, the, 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 uh, the issue about the world being flat, we see that we're all one flat world and community. So one problem in one area really does affect uh, other, everyone around the world, given air travel, the internet, all the problems we have, the world, or all the communication systems we have, you know, the world truly is flat. So how do we, you know, the question I ask is how do we, how do we respond to, a, to these first world nation problems um, when we have in, our own interest involved, when we have our own people on a Malaysia air, airplane or we have, we have our own citizens in a country, a first world country that, that may be in jeopardy. So, so what do we do? How do we respond to the first world to first world? We're very good at responding first world to third or second or third world for humanitarian crisis. We, we do a great job with, with tsunamis or, or whatever the, human, the Stafford Act in the United States provides for us to, to provide support from a humanita humanitarian support. And we have, uh, we have government organizations like DART and others that are very good at the first 30 days of providing support, but this was a lot different. This was a nat tech disaster, you know, natural technology disaster, and it was prolonged. So it was a much different uh, situation. And for nuclear, I worry, I wonder, and worry about uh, other nations, emerging nations that have nuclear power. How do we, if they have a, an issue, if they have an event, how are we sure that we will get information from them and that we can understand what's going on? So that we can protect our own people. So, I think, you know, I I I think there there needs to be a protocol established for countries, whether it's aircraft, Malaysia Air, you've seen the the Russia and the the uh, and and the other Malaysia uh, aircraft um, communications has not always been ideal. So we need we need an international protocol for communication of these events of common terminologies in the Fukushima case. There were emergency classifications were not consistent with, uh, with the international community or even the United States. So we have emergency protocols that are not consistent around the world. We don't have the same shared data, ways to share data, and we don't have the best practices. So, so it needs to be some common uh, framework for countries to be able to get information uh, from other nations uh, even first world nations when these severe events occur. With regard to the, uh, with regard to the, the Fukushima event, when we came uh, to Japan, there was a lot of missing information, a lot of information that was not accurate, a lot of missing, missing information, uh, and because it was unknowable, the, much of the reactor information systems had been, had been damaged, so the, the, the information was, you know, was unknowable. I don't, I don't think it was that people were not sharing information as it was. You, so how do you lead a crisis? How do you lead a crisis? When, you know, I've said before that it's like um, trying to solve a murder case and not, and not having access to the, to the uh, crime scene. So, so how, do you, how do you do that when you have false misleading data from either press accounts or 
wherever the source of the information comes from, informal communications. So that's a huge challenge is to manage a crisis. Governments act deliberative. They're typically slow to react uh, in terms of sharing information with the public or even assimilating the information to be able to understand the conditions themselves. Meanwhile, people like you, to press people, are pursuing every possible lead imaginable. Fukushima was, I think, the first web-streamed nuclear accident. So it was real-time. You're getting real-time data from, from TV pictures. But yet, the operators in the plant couldn't get information themselves. So there was a big disconnect in terms of getting data. I know for our, uh, for our response, for the American response, uh, you know, we had missteps ourselves in getting data. Uh, we worked engineer to engineer for a while, and we quickly learned that no one engineer had all the information. So if you, you, know, you get information, you get piecemeal information from different data sources, and if you're not working high enough in the organization, then you're not getting a global picture of what's going on. So, so you have to, we learned that lesson rather quickly that um, because not one, in, one person has all the information, then you have to go, so, go high enough that you can get a better picture of what the, information, what the information is. And ultimately, it took us about 10 days, I think, between us and, and the Japanese to really get organized and get a battle rhythm uh, where we could share information, share advice, listen to each other. And once we started the Kantai meetings, um, once we started the Kantai meetings on the 21st of March and meeting every night, uh, then uh, a rhythm started to occur. We would have meetings in the morning, meetings all day, people would get data, and we, uh, we, the other thing that happened was we had sources of information that were unfamiliar to us as well. And, and uh, so if you have a source of information that's, it, that's unfamiliar to you, maybe thermal information, and if you don't know how to interpret it correctly, then that too can cause misleading information. So uh, there's, pl <laughs> there's plenty of misleading and, and uh, wrong information that comes out in these crises. So it's weeding out you know, what's right, what's wrong, and, and how to react. And particularly trying to keep the speed of your reaction equivalent to the speed of the, speed of the accident. So you gotta keep the speed of the response equivalent or greater than the speed of the accident. And that's very difficult to do, particularly for governments. Um, I think if we narrow down and, and we look at from, from that, from the information, and we look at the uh, Fukushima accidents itself, I, I, th I believe there were five crises. You can see here a lot of people talking about three crises at Fukushima the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear event. But I believe there were five. The five crises obviously were the earthquake, the tsunami, uh, the nuclear event. There was a societal crisis and a policy crisis. So I think you have to look at it from those five perspectives or you, you won't solve, you won't address all the problems if you don't look at it from those five perspectives. It's more than just a, a nuclear accident. Um, I think that it, it was, you know, it's an organizational accident. It's a systems, you know, the system uh, breakdown. So you have to look at what was the balance, what's the balance of power? And if you go, if you go back to in the 1900s in Japan with the electrical system and multiple utilities, many, many utilities, and ultimately after, in the 40s it was narrowed down to nine utilities. <laughs> And there was a competition set up between those nine utilities. And then you lay over top of that the nuclearization of Japan, how they nuclearized Japan. Uh, most of the expertise and the power rested in the hands of the utilities. And uh, so there was an imbalance of power. And, and, uh, and I think that imbalance of power was uh, one of the root causes of the, of the accident, uh, the structural the system's uh, flaws that, that emerged with the regulator, with the government itself, the emergency response. So I think um, unless you address those other two crises, the societal issues and the policy issues, which essentially the policy issue is the balance of power, 
then, then it, until you do that, then restart is difficult. The, uh, the balance of power today, I think, is mostly in the hands of, of, of the regulator in Japan for them to determine the, the, the readiness of the plants. However, I think that, that balance needs to be shared. I believe that, that the uh, operators uh, should seek operational excellence. It should be clear that they are responsible for safety. So I know that there's, there's not a lot of appetite for sharing power with the utilities, but we have to do that. If, if, there's, if there's to be a future, uh, then the utilities have to take on their responsibility. Uh, the elected officials, I think, the elected officials have to take on their responsibility to listen to the people and provide uh, emergency response structure and uh, the, the uh, national government, the elected officials. There, there has to be a national dialogue on risk, on the, willing, the level of risk that is acceptable for the people. Because in the end, in the end, uh, the people of any country determine how much risk they are willing to accept. The elected officials may believe they have control of that, but in the end it's the people, because the people will, will stand up if they don't accept the level of risk that is occurs. So it's, um, the, it's a, that balance of power, I think, and, and included in that balance of power is, is proper balance between the regulator and the government. They've encouraged the regulator to be independent. We've encouraged the regulator to be independent, but part of that is not just independent, but, but you can't be isolated either. Okay, so the regulator has to listen. I was a regulator for 27 years. Openness and transparency for the regulator and um, for the government, for the elected officials to determine that level of risk that the country is is willing to accept. That line, that level of risk has to be uh, created and then the regulator regulates to that level of risk rather than the regulator deciding the level of risk um, that the country is willing to accept. Of course, the, the uh, you know, lowest risk for a reactor is, is a re reactor that doesn't operate. And, and so, so you, if, you, if you decide, if you have that national discussion and say, this is the level of risk that we're willing to accept, then the elected officials have to establish that in law, and then the regulator regulates to that line, whatever, whatever that level of risk is that the, that the country has decided. And if the country, through a national dialogue, decides that they, they can't accept the level of risk, then that's the decision that you, that you have to make. So in, unless you step through all five of these crises, the tsunami, the, let's just start with the nuclear event. You know, the nuclear event itself with Daiichi, you've, you've got to prove that you can resolve that nuclear event. You've got to prove to the people that you can resolve that issue. You can resolve Daiichi. And that is also dependent on the level, level of risk that you ex they're willing to accept for Daiichi. So you've got to prove that. And then you have to talk with society about emergency planning, and the regulator has to appreciate emergency planning so that, so that the people are protected. And before you, you know, before you can make a decision, then you have to address those issues. You have to address the societal issues, and you have to address the policy issues and the policy crisis that's occurring. So I think uh, hopefully, um, Hopefully I've summarized you know, my thoughts on, on this uh, enough that we can have some questions. Uh, I would say that I hope, you know, I, I, my experience in Japan uh, was life changing and it changed, completely changed uh, my perspective. Uh, I was a former operator and been a former regulator, but when you travel through uh, that evacuated zone, the only thing that comes to your mind is we can never let this happen again, uh, anywhere, anywhere in the world. As a former operator and a former regulator, I was up there yesterday, and uh, both Daiichi and Daini, and to see the progress, and um, you know, we can't we we can't let that happen again. And I I am extremely thankful uh, for my time in Japan, 
I, 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 it's a wonderful country wonder, with wonderful pe people, and I wish them a, a lot of luck on, on the future. Um, and I hope that in the future that, 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 this, this, uh, that there are more pages in, in science books about this accident in Japan than there are in history books. So, so I think we, we have to learn about <coughs> nuclear and, and about the effects of nuclear uh, energy. And we can do that th but through education in the science books. And I, and I encourage uh, us to do that in the science book rather than just the history books. So with that, uh, Eric Guthrie, thank you. Thanks very much. Dr. Kessler. Um, we'll open the floor to questions uh, to working members of the press first. Please, uh, when you approach the microphone, please state your name and your affiliation. One question per person and no speeches. <laughs> Siegfried Knittel, freelancer from Germany. Hi. Uh, when uh, Mr. Yoshida published, uh, or when the uh, memoirs of Mr. Yoshida, Yoshida was published, he said at one point he made a mistake. He did understand. He didn't understand uh, the, res, uh, the valves in the emergency uh, the number and uh, react, reactor number one. He didn't. So he didn't. So he didn't. Uh, talk his, his stuff too close or to open the valve. Right. So mm -hmm. that was a, one reason for the explosion of the... But it was a, the problem of Mr. Yoshida. He didn't self, he didn't understand it. So does it not mean this kind of uh, technology is too complicated or too difficult for people to understand, even for this kind of managers? The other point. They have uh, six, six re reactors in, in, uh, in, uh, in the Fukushima Daiichi. In uh, Kashiwazaki, they have seven. In, in Tsuru, in Tsu, I think in Fukui, in Tsuruka, they have also five or six. Is it not too complicated, too difficult to deal with so many reactors at one plant? Uh, both good questions, Siegfried, uh, and I appreciate, uh, I appreciate them. And and I'm not used to reporters going to the microphone. Usually they're sticking a microphone in my face. Uh, but I, <laughs> it was good to see that you We're do very that. very civilized. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, when it comes to, to Yoshida and what Yoshida did and what Yoshida uh, knew, and, and I, I think w what I look at is it's hard to judge. It's hard to judge at that time, if any of us in that position. Um, it, it's hard to judge their performance uh, because there was just so much information and so much data and so much missing data. So, so I, I'm very reluctant to, to judge their performance. I think they did the best they can, they could at the time. But what it tells us is about, it, what the real issue is I think about, is about crisis leadership and putting so much responsibility on one person and to look at look at the incident command system. I think the lesson learned there, Siegfried, for that is we, we, you, know, the, you need an incident command system that's, that's bigger, as big as the accident, let's just say that. So, so some, of the, some of these events, whether it's the nuclear event, what, some of these big crises, even Deepwater Horizon, uh, particularly uh, some of the natural events, they're too big for one person to be, to be the sole decider and the sole Knowledge. On the other hand, you know, Yoshida knew about the injection points that that no one else knew about. So, you know, not one of us has all the knowledge of, of anything. So, if we work together in an instant command system, then you have a better chance at responding to these big events. So, I guess that would be my answer for that. I don't know if it satisfies you, but I but I understand, Siegfried. Uh, and then I guess that's. Uh, the, the same answer for having six or seven units at one, one place. I worked at a three-unit site. I worked for many years at a three-unit site. And, um, and it's just a matter of scale to have, to have make sure that you, you basically you treat each unit 
separately, not as you're operating six units. You're operating, and in fact, I was just the last two weeks at a three-unit site, a different three-unit site. Um, and, and what you have to look at is let's treat each reactor individually, not as and have not have a leadership structure that tries to operate seven units, but have six separate leadership structures and maybe a you know a leader at the top. So you just have to make sure that you have the right the right response capability for each reactor. That I guess that would be my answer. Probably not satisfying, but my answer. Other questions? Actually, can I just jump in on that one? You we talk started out with a couple of really hard ones, Aaron. You didn't, you didn't tell me they were going to be hard questions. <laughs> um, some people say, just to address your point on having the right response capabilities, there are some who argue that we effectively dodged a bullet because it, the disaster happened during working hours on a Friday. Right. Um, yep. It had it been on a weekend, the staff would have been there would have been a lot less staff. That's a valid um, point, do you think? And do you think Japan has sufficiently addressed that issue? I, I, thanks, Aaron. I, I you know I don't think having more people is a bad thing. More, having more people is a good thing. In fact, I think they had had a an all hand what we call an all hands meeting that day, which was you know had all the people together. Uh, there's you know there's two sides to having too many people. Uh, one, you have to protect them all. Uh, but what you re really want to have is a command system that's the right size. So as we're talking about with Siegfried, so you have a command system and you, you want to make sure that your command, incident command system is, is of, of, a, of sufficient size. And then if you have more people, then that's, that's obviously better. You just don't want to have fewer people. Uh, so we operate thousands, you know, thousands of reactor hours with a weekend staffing um, and you have the ability to, to call people in and you also want to make sure that you have the standalone ability if you can't call people in, that you have the sufficient minimum number of people on staff to respond to the accident. Okay, uh, who wants to ask a question? Uh, Ichiro Tokumoto, Freelance for Japanese yeah. Magazine. Um, I have uh, one more question about the uh, response capability and uh, crisis management. Uh, good. Um, Prime Minister Kang, former Prime Minister mm. Kang, Hi. and DPJ has been under heavy fire Hi. for their uh, number of mistakes, uh, allegedly uh, mistakes in the crisis management. So my question is, if Abe was in command, <laughs> and if LDP was in power on March 11, 2011, do you think they made some difference in the crisis management? Well, thanks for that question. Uh, and Thank, and also, one quick question. <laughs> one more quick question is: uh, uh, when we look at the uh, history of the Japan's nuclear energy industry, it was the U.S. government and the U.S. energy industry who provided the nuclear reactors to the uh, yeah. Japanese right. utilities, right. including TEPCO. Right. So, do you think um, they did they did their best to teach the crisis management? Wow, these questions just get harder, Aaron. <laughs> you, you didn't tell can't, me. Can't help that. But he just drugged me right in. I can't pronounce your name. I'm sorry. I apologize. But uh, just he just pulled me right into the politics of the situation there. So uh, that'll be different. It will. It would have been different. There's no doubt about that, right? It, it doesn't matter if it was a, a neutral party or a green party or whatever. If it's if it's a different person, it will be a different response. But I, I think. Structurally, you know, the sort of the lesson learned goes back to that balance of power, and, and here, here's the difference on, uh, between um, what I saw in, in Japan and what I'd see somewhere else, I think. That, and that is, in, in, in a lot of countries, you have an independent source of information at the reactor that, it, that belongs to the government. Okay, the government has people at the site now, NISA had people at the site, but they weren't assigned to the site, right? They weren't assigned there, and I'm not sure what happened to those NISA people, I think we know. But the expectation in, in a lot of countries is that, that you'll have people assigned there, and those people will stay and go to the control room to understand what's, what the situation is, and those people work independently for the government. So, um, cons, 
uh, I think one of the one of the issues with that response at that time was you didn't have that source of independent information. So he didn't have anybody that he could pick up the phone and call to get a to get an independent source of information. So so he relied on other sources of information. Some of those I think ultimately he questioned their their efficacy of the, some of those other organizations and and you know learned that you know they they may not have provided him the best guidance. So when he you know I, I think in that terms in terms of understanding the information flow um, he, he didn't have that source of independent information, and that really hampered uh, the response at the top. Because you want to be able to shorten, you know, shorten the, the organizational chain. You want to flatten the organization. You want to be able to talk from the top of the organization to the people at the scene. And if you don't have that, then that, that's a huge gap. And uh, the second question was, uh, didn't, didn't the U.S. do this or something like that? Right? <laughs> but yeah, the, you know, the, the reactors are obviously U.S. design, general, GE design. I think the thing that you have to look at is, was the evolution of all the countermeasures over the years, how was that evolution done? Was it efficient and effective? Did they learn over the years? Did the Japanese, after, after Three Mile Island, after 9-11, after all these big events, did they learn and did they make adjustments as nuclear power continued in Japan? So I think that's what you have to go back and look at is that evolution. Or did they, did they um, start the reactors in the 70s and 80s and not learn and not, you know, so, so that difference, I think, is the difference. In the United States, after, I mean, one of the good things about about uh, what we've done is we were hi highly critical of ourselves after each event that we've had, whether it, whether it was 9-11. Actually, after Three Mile Island, we were so critical of ourselves, and we, we issued thousands of pages of new regulations and guidelines and, and, and really, um, really uh, just overwhelmed the industry with new regulations. And, and in reality, we spent about the next 20 years uh, trying to you know, trying to be more reasonable because we, we so swung the pendulum in one direction that, um, again, you know, um, you, you, you overwhelm and, and create too many, too many um, bar new, new constraints. And some of those, as the theories will show, like James Rees and all those professors will say that, you know, high reliability organizations, you just, just layering on more and more defenses doesn't necessarily bring you safety. Does that, does that make, that make sense? This gentleman here. Thank you very much. I'm Robert Bizarre, Temple University Robert, of Japan. I recognize you. Temple uh, University. Right? Uh, just a short question. What did you think at the beginning was the worst case scenario? <laughs> well, I, I'll be honest with you, Robert. That's a really good. Uh, I, at some point that first week, um, I, I, I believed that, uh, that the worst was probably over at, at first, after the explosions of the buildings, because the, the energy, the source of energy that would lift radioactivity out of the buildings, the zirconium, the zircaloy, the cladding, the hydrogen, was expended. So uh, if you could, the, the lesson of Three Mile Island was any amount of water on the fuel uh, really helps a lot, keeps it cool, and keeps, keeps the react. So almost any amount of water is a good thing and will keep the, keep the core cold enough to prevent any other uh, explosions. So uh, I, myself, I just, my personal feeling was I, I couldn't see without, unless they shut off injection and you started steaming and, and have a steam explosion of some kind, uh, I, I thought that we'd probably seen the worst after that, after that, after the 15th, something like that, after Unit 4. Of course, Unit, unit 4, all the fuel was in the spent fuel pool. It wasn't in the reactor. So um, as long as we kept, as they kept water pumping in, I thought we would be, uh, that that was probably the worst case. And, 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 and the other thing I think we have to talk about is more reactors doesn't mean, uh, more uh, contamination further. 
somewhat further, but it's not linear. You know, four reactors doesn't mean you're gonna have contamination four times greater because it all has to do with the weight of the isotopes, the wind conditions, the weather conditions, depositing out, all right? So you'll have higher quantity, but it may not go out further as for, you know, as for, because the, the isotopes have a certain weight, the wind conditions, uh, it's, not lin it's not a linear situation. So um, at that point, I, I, I felt pretty confident that, that keeping water on the reactors was, was sufficient. Before the explosion, I, I, I tell you, I, I, I underestimated uh, the severity. You know, I, I didn't think we would see the hydrogen explosions. Like I said, when I, you know, my, my optimistic feeling when I was, I was at the gas station putting gas in my truck when some, one of my neighbors called me and said, How, you know, what's up with these reactors in Japan? And I said, well, they'll get power on it, it'll be, it'll be fine. So I, I definitely underestimated initially this, the, the, the uh, worst case scenario. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Crowell with Nuclear Intelligence Weekly. Uh, could you tell us, in your opinion, what did the Japanese do right in the initial stages of the accident, and mm. what did they do wrong? Mm. Well, uh, the right part is, is I'll, I'll start with that. The right part is uh, seawater injection. All right, and I've said that before, when Yoshida decided to inject seawater, that that was the right thing to do. Um, so that was key, and I think, I think that in and of itself was uh, very uh, important and probably greatly mitigated the ultimate outcome. So that was right. I mean, the operators, uh, did, and not only did they do the best they could in that case, they did absolutely the right thing. Uh, so that was, uh, and, and probably, uh, if I would say the wrong thing, or is that what you, right and wrong, I think is the way you characterize that. Uh, and I think you see it in Yoshida's transcripts. Um, the isolation of the plant from the outside, and and uh, not you know they became they were they were became more and more isolated as the situation went on, and relying upon just those people at the site, and and resources didn't really flow in to the site, and you know. Um, MacArthur has a quote, talks about, uh, in sum, the failures of war can be summed up in two words, most failures in wartime, and that, those two words are too late, all right? And so typically what happens when you have a failure of crisis or failure of wartime, it's because you didn't get something there. You didn't react fast enough. You didn't get there, something there in time. Uh, so getting, getting uh, resources to the site and and they struggled mightily to do that i mean this was a condition that was you know black swan as they call it, it was an unprepared you know uh, it, it was a condition we were not prepared for i think people have learned today and, and a lot of countries have taken countermeasures to to be able to get the resources there to build resilience of the plant one of the lessons learned of fukushima is is that is to to make the site more resilient uh, either either temporary power supplies or in the United States we have what's called flex. We have two, two locations in the country where we have massive amounts of equipment that can be flown and it's been determined ahead of time that the logistics can happen, that the equipment's not too heavy for airplanes or helicopters and that equipment can be flown into the site and responded to if it has, if it has a significant problem. So what we learned from 9-11 was that the installed systems in the reactors could be destroyed by an aircraft crash. So we, we said, we told the utilities, the operator, you have to have some, some spare equipment nearby that you can bring in to, to put in place of the installed equipment that was destroyed. Now what we learned from Fukushima is that equipment has to be further away 
You not only have to have that equipment in close, but you need equipment further away in case you have a natural disaster or some kind of external event that even wipes out the equipment we put in uh, after 9-11. After so, so I think you know, getting, getting equipment, getting resources in fast enough uh, in time. So, so you know, one of the things we're trying to do is make sure that these sites can sustain themselves for 72 hours or more uh, in a crisis, any, any size crisis, for 72 hours or more to give the national government uh, time to get proper resources there. Uh, so we, we want 72 hours or more of resilience for the site. Abby. Hi, I'm Abby Sakimitsu from MSN, that's Microsoft's news portal. Um, I use that all the time, too. You use that all it's the time, almost, thank you. It's almost my homepage. I think it is my homepage. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, now, can your question be a little bit, you know? <laughs> soft? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think this is soft. Okay. Um, so Parliament's in session again, and um, politicians are being questioned about the restarts. And our politicians are very fond of saying that, you know, they're confident because they've cleared the highest standard of global safety. And they say that all the time. And do you think that's correct? And given what you said about the different protocols and the different uh, sources of data, et cetera, is such a thing even achievable? Well, thanks for the question. I, I think, um, I, I guess my point is that that's probably true for earthquake and tsunami and all the technical issues, all those technical issues that, that the NRA, the Japanese government, is looking to make sure that they exceed the international standards. I, that's likely to be true. And uh, I haven't looked at it, and I'm not an expert in those areas, so I, I don't know. But I, I would say that that's likely to be true. They probably, like we did at Three Mile Island, you know, the pendulum's probably all the way over to the to the one side on those issues. What I, what I, the issues that I think that, that are important is the, the societal issues, the risk issues, the emergency planning issues that the, that the technical people, uh, you know, maybe not be as, have as much interest in, but the people have lots of interest in those, in those societal issues, and you have to address those because, be, honestly, I mean, to be, to, to be, the reason we have all those things like emergency planning and things is in case that is, in case those technical people are incorrect, right? If they're wrong, and something happens, then you want to have proper treatment of society. You want to have proper emergency plans, proper, make sure that you can get people uh, evacuated or sheltered using the sheltering process rather than just trying to move millions of people. Let's, let's get better at sheltering. So I think those issues, part of the equation, have to be addressed, um, comprehensively addressed. The technical part, I think, you know, the technical part, we're good technical people in the, in the nuclear industry. But we, we need to work on that societal and the policy part of it. And, I, and that's my point with the five crises. If you don't look at the policy side and if you don't look at the societal side and you just rely on the technical, you're missing a piece of it, pieces of it. Any more questions? Eric Bonnard, freelance journalist from Germany. Uh, when did you have a, a did you think you had a good view or idea of who was making what decision and and did that change <laughs> over the time you you spent it, it it did um i think there was there was probably a struggle within the japanese government who was who was in in charge and and uh, when they unified their command with uh, the government and TEPCO, the, the unified command structure that they came up with. And I think that really organized it. And then, as I said before, once we started the Conti meetings, where we had to work bilaterally, uh, uh, and they had to prepare for that, those meetings, uh, I think that really helped coalesce their government into, in, into understanding and responding to the event. And this was about 10 days after? Well, yeah, it was in that first well, from the initial and, until the 21st, 
You know, there was there, the 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 command structure was un, in my mind was unclear. I mean, there was MOD and you know um, uh, S, uh, SDF, MOD, uh, TEPCO, NISA, uh, and and the emergency the, the Conti Emergency Center. So where all the command structure and the flow was was confusing to me. But then as we went along in those first 10 days, I think uh, by them unifying command made a big difference. And, that, and so that's, I think you have to go back and look at your incident command system as part of the policy piece of that crisis, fifth crisis. And did you feel it changed after the 21st? Or did I think after the 21st, it was pretty solidified oh. that there wasn't a lot of changes uh, after, after the 21st from a command structure. It changed later, about a year later or so, where the government then sort of, uh, after cold shutdown, it changed to the government sort of backed out of the command and, and took on their, you know, their role uh, as, an over, as, as an oversight. Well, uh, I would say there's still more work to be done in the two areas that I talked about. It, uh, like I said before, you can, you can layer and layer and layer requirements on, on any technology, safety of any technology. That doesn't necessarily mean you get safer outcomes. I'll just jump in here. I think it's an understatement to say that there was a lot of confusion in those first 10 days. The government seemed to be all over the place and TEPCO even more. Uh, but can I ask you whether, what's your view on the Khan intervention when he flew up to Fukushima? Do you think he saved the nation? Or well, I don't know. I don't know if I'd go that big, but I would say it goes back to what I said. Khan, Khan when he looked at the or different organizations that were providing him advice, and when he, this is just my, uh, my own personal summation. If I were, if, if I put myself in his shoes, I look at all these organizations, and I'm not sure I'm getting solid advice from them, and I don't have somebody to call there that works for me at the site. Then, if I'm a if I'm a commander, you know, if I'm if I'm a commander, then I'm going to want to go put my eyes on it myself. All right. So so from that perspective, do I agree with everything? No, I don't agree with everything. But from that perspective of information, uh, I, I get it, that you as a commander, you want to know. One of the things when Dick Thornburg, I talked to Governor Thornburg at, from th Three Mile Island <coughs> last year. I interviewed Governor Thornburg. And one of the things he told me as his lessons learned was, you know, anchoring facts. He was a lawyer. So he would interrogate facts and interrogate people who brought him the facts, right, to see how solid they are with the facts. Where did you get your facts from? What's your source? Not only what your fact is, but where did it come from? So he, would, he, he was successful at Three Mile Island. Governor Thorberg did an amazing job at Three Mile Island. And the reason he did was because he interrogated the facts and he interrogated the people who brought him the facts. And that led to his success at Three Mile Island. So, you know, the lesson we have to learn is to do that when we have a crisis. And if you don't, if you interrogate the fact bringer, <laughs> I don't know if that's the right English word, but, but if you bring it, you know, if you don't interrogate the fact bringer, then you're gonna, you're gonna get, you're gonna, you're gonna fail. Because you don't know where those facts came from. So I think that's a huge crisis, you know, leadership uh, uh, lesson learned. And it relates to your question, I believe, Aaron. Yeah. Go ahead. You had a question. I thought you had, no. you put your arm up, hand up. Yeah, yeah, then Carl. Oh, uh, my name is Carl Fasser. I'm not a journalist, but I, I'm an honorary member here. Well, well. Anyway, so one question is: uh, there were a lot of rumors going around, and maybe you know the answers if these rumors are true or not. Uh, one rumor is that. Um, uh, it goes something like this, the government of Japan initially didn't take the crisis seriously enough and the US threatened to send 120 experts to station inside the uh, Kante 
to kind of uh, advise directly. Oh. Is that true? Okay. No, that's not true. It's not true. Okay. And <laughs> it's, it's not true. Okay. No. Uh, another well, we ended up with 150 some people in the embassy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in response, the embassy, the embassy staff, the team that I was working with swelled up to about 150, 160 okay. people. But, but that, that was it. And what you started are these regular meetings you had every day after 21st. Right. Okay. And uh, that was between who and who? Uh, it was the it was the cabinet, the cabinet, the, the ministers, the ministers, okay. right? And uh, and and us, the U.S. Oh, delegation. How many people were in U.S.? Oh, there was I don't know. Any oh. given night, there was probably 30, 40 people oh, in that room. Yeah. Out of these 150. Right. Oh, yes. Yeah. So the American. We would bring probably. 10, 15 people, something like that. And these were like top experts like you, the best people U.S. had, yes, essentially. Yes, I have, yes. Yeah. Uh, the other kind of rumor is, uh, which goes something like this, is TEPCO wanted to withdraw completely and leave everything to the mm. local uh, mm. fire service. I've heard that rumor. And is that true or not? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if we'll ever know the answer to that question. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever know the answer uh, to that question. Nobody knows. I, I don't yeah. know that, I mean, it's, there's a lot of speculation. The people who were involved have spoken, and I don't know if where you know I don't I don't I, I don't have enough information. Don't know, but I do know I I believe that that um, there would have been uh, uh, so, uh, uh, there would have been uh, sufficient protection, regardless of what happened. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Did you check his uh, this ID for this guy right here? Okay. Yeah, I think <laughs> Kyle Clayton, Temple University. Um, Chuck, I know that you're out at Daiichi and Daini yesterday. Yeah. And could you provide a little detail of your impressions? Also, how those have changed from the two or three years since you were last there? Do you think they're taking the appropriate actions? And and just what your in, good. in some detail what your impressions good. are. Good. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, Dr. Cleveland. The um, I was there, I think last September was the last time I was there. And uh, I would say at Daiichi, there's much more activity even in the last year, much more. And they're making progress. The groundwater is the biggest issue. And uh, the, the activity, the, 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 the initiatives that they've taken, I think, have reduced the groundwater by about 25%, which is good. And they continued a number of different strategies to uh, to reduce the amount of groundwater in leakage, which is causing the biggest problem, is the groundwater leaking in into the plant, and then you have to, then you have to either treat that groundwater or store it after you know when it has tritium in it. So uh, that, and, and the level of effort is immense. I, I'm amazed at the level of effort. There is they are sparing no resources uh, to respond to uh, to to uh, to the situation. The, the decommissioning, uh, a tremendous amount of people and, and effort going on, both from the sea and the land side, uh, and and working very hard. People working very diligently, and uh, and and working for the future at, at that place. So I was I was uh, it was there was much more activity there this time than there was uh, last time that I was there, and they've made good progress with Unit Four. And uh, we'll make progress with Unit Three and Unit One uh, soon. And and Dine, uh, I always enjoy going to Dine uh, because I th I think uh, as as you know uh, Masuda San's leadership at Dine uh, was outstanding. What he did and and responded to that event, <clears throat> and mitigating that event. So I I am uh, tremendously respectful of of. Both Yoshida and and Masuda, I think they did. They think they did masterful jobs uh, with what the conditions that they had, and in the, the system that they had. I think uh, that those two uh, gentlemen and their staffs worked heroically um, to do the best they could with the situation that they had. Yes, sir. Jacob. You told me there'd be like two or three questions. In there. <laughs> Jake uh, Badel in Bloomberg News. Thank you. Um, so uh, you said that there are uh, societal risk and emergency planning issues that still need to be addressed. Um, I think you uh, spelled out the, the risk issues pretty well, that there needs to be the dialogue about the level of risk. 
Um, they're willing to accept it on the societal and emergency planning side. Can you share some specifics uh, about what needs to be done there? Uh, and also, I wanted to ask, uh, just as a follow-up to the last question, um, specifically on the, um, the ice wall, what's your uh, analysis of, of the potential for that? Well, I'll take the last first. I have no uh, technical understanding or ability to judge the ice wall, <laughs> All right, so I, I'm, I, don't, I have no idea uh, whether that ice wall is, uh, will work or is a good idea or not a good idea. I, I just don't have any basis to judge the ice wall. So sorry, but that's outside my outside my area of expertise. I think for the for the emergency planning side of it, you know, I think um, well first on the on the societal side, as I said, you've, you've really got to have a national discussion about risk and about emergency preparedness, and that has to be a national discussion with the elected leaders, so that the elected leaders can establish the standards and the organization and the guidelines to protect the people. And uh, whatever that is, whether that's uh, emergency planning zones, the size of your emergency planning zone, whether that's staging emergency equipment. I mean, much as we staged, you know, I talked about we staged uh, 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 m mitigating systems for the reactors. We staged that information. Whether on the, on the societal sta side, it's staging uh, emergency measures you know, whether, whatever those emergency potassium iodide, whatever emergency measures, you, have, you know, stockpiling that, providing uh, staging that's not only good for uh, a nuclear accident, but any other event you might have. To, to have it flexible, you know, more than, just a, you know, more than just for the nuclear accident, but it's general emergency planning for the nation of any, for any technology or any disaster. So, a little bit harder thinking, I think, on emergency, and, and is it realistic? Realistic planning and realistic scenarios of evacuation or sheltering. Uh, so, so, I mean, if you have major cities, you're going to shelter. You're not going to try to evacuate in any kind, whether it's a chlorine release or nuclear release, whatever release it is, biological, whatever it is, you're, you're not going to evacuate major cities. So it's about, you know, how do we shelter? What's the sheltering process we have to have for, for, for different, um, you know, biologics, radio, CBRN events are called, chemical, nuclear, radiological, but, you know, bio, biological chem, uh, events. So looking at that emergency plan and the societal side, people want to know they're protected. They want to know that, that, you know, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, first and second level, you know, secure, safety and security. So people want to know that they're being protected. <laughs> So I think, I, I think that's an area where we can, we can all, not just Japan, but all nations can, can work on, on that area, societal risk. Uh, my name is Fujita. Fujita. And I'm at the Kokumin Shimbun. Ah. Uh, they say it's a right-wing paper. A what paper? Right wing. Oh, right wing. <laughs> My I question, don't know. I don't have any wings. <laughs> uh, uh, but the problem I have is that a lot of right wing people are against nuclear gen power generation. Now, my question is, uh, having all said, discussed, uh, I feel that nuclear power generation is safest, safest energy source. Of course, we have to t you know, take all necessary measures to right. prevent risks disasters, right. but uh, what's your opinion? Uh, well, do you, do you, are you for, for nuclear here, power here, generation? That's a good, I'm glad you asked that question. I'm really glad. Here, here's what I'm, I am pro-safety, okay? That's what I am, all right? I'm not pro-nuclear, I'm not anti-nuclear, I am for safety. That's what I'm for, okay? So my career has been spent as a nuclear operator and as a regulator you know, worrying about safety. So I think that the people have to decide the risk. They have to decide, yes, gas has risk. Coal obviously has risk. All of them, if you take the entire supply chain, somewhere in there they all have, they all have risk, societal risk to people. Any human activity has some risk to humans, right? So, in, in, you know, nuclear is called the people, uh, a German, uh, Peter Senge, 
something like that, uh, called it the domesticate, nuclear the domestication of the second fire. If you go back and look at, you know, when mankind started to domestify fire, there were people, you know, hey, we can't bring fire into our houses, it'll burn our houses down. We can't, you know, there was anti-fire people <laughs> and pro-fire people, right? So this is, a, this, is, this is centuries old, this debate about mankind developing technology is, you know, airplanes, and it's gone through all technologies. So I decided not to sit on either side of those debates and say the people decide. The people have to decide what they're willing to accept, whether they want nuclear power or don't want nuclear power. Okay, if you decide you want nuclear power, call me up. Okay, because I'll help you make it safe. But otherwise, if you don't, then have a nice day. And, you know, so, uh, I, you know, that's, I'm pro-safety. That's my position. So what wing is that? <laughs> is that do you have time for a, I do. a couple more? I do. Well, Siegfried first. Siegfried? I don't know. No, the last time, Siegfried, didn't he? but anyway. Oh, I thought he. That's okay. He'll be next. Dr. Casto. Before I moved to Asia, I worked in the uh, nuclear industri industry myself, the American nuclear industry. I've been in NRC graded emergency t t tests, which our operating license depended on. But I don't see anything like that going on in Japan now. The uh, NRA seems to deal mostly in paperwork right. without assessing the human resources and whether they are uh, capable and simulated emergency conditions. Do you have any comment on that? I, I, I do. I think that that's, I think I've said that, or tried to say that, 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 that it's not just a technical piece. They've got to get engaged in the societal piece, the protecting society, the societal piece of it, and understanding what pe the people are willing to accept to make sure people are protected. So it's all, both sides of that equation have to be addressed. And without that, then you can't ask the question. You're not ready to ask the question, is restart, uh, is restart uh, satisfactory or ready, whatever. And until you address both sides of that equation by the regulator and by the elected officials, you're not ready to ask that question. Okay, one more question. Uh, the, this is the easy one, right? <laughs> <laughs> You said Japan has perhaps no uh, very strong or perhaps the strongest uh, regulation, security regulations for a power plant. But if you look at, at uh, earthquake security, I think they predict uh, every time a kind of uh, the heaviest case of an uh, earthquake. But a lot of scientists say, one of the American scientists, Robert Geller, said, there is no, you cannot predict an earthquake. Right. Right. So, in this way, is it possible, makes it sense to have uh, this kind of prediction of earthquake with a, not, with a really uh, a low level of the earthquake prediction? To, and th to, and then to say we have the highest uh, security standard. Right. Well, I mean, this goes back to, there, there's a lot of ways to answer that question, but the, thank you for it. And I think this goes back to, uh, you know, I don't want fire in my house. That's one of the earthquakes, just like the fire question is, you can come up with all kinds of possibilities with earthquakes or volcanoes or whatever other hazard it is. So that's why you, you want to plan in, in the event that you're wrong. Right? They can have those, those earthquake people can have those debates about prediction and what, how many gall that you, you know, and I'm not a scientist in earthquakes. So me as a pro-safety person, what I say is I don't know about all that technical stuff and they need to resolve it by the international standards, but I worry about what if they're wrong? What if the experts are wrong? And if the experts are wrong, then I have to be prepared in my emergency planning side to be, if they're wrong in their debates. And I think to answer the question from Bloomberg, I think further on an example, let me give you a specific example. You, you made me think about the earthquake and the, the societal. The, um, one of the things you have in Japan that I think is amazing is this uh, and text system of uh, the earthquakes. I, I don't know what it's called, but you get like a text message on your cell phone or something uh, about uh, 
you know, the earthquake's coming and it's certain magnitude and duration, something like that, you get, a, you get an early warning signal. You know, I, I think from, a, from an emergency planning sort of view, you could have the same thing for a nuclear plant, right? If a nuclear plant, you know, shuts down or has an accident, people can be informed of it. That's one way to inform, inform the public, you know, keep them engaged. Okay, yes, the nuclear plant shut down and everything is okay, right? That it responded adequately, that there's no concerns. You could have that kind of messaging system set up for your, for your local nuclear plants to make sure that people get, because they see, it on, they, you know, they see it on television through the web streaming, but you want a dialogue straight from the utility or the government with the people. Not, you know, I value the media a lot. I, you know. <laughs> Yeah, but, but I give you guys a little hug. The, uh, I value the media a lot, but they, the people also want to know from their government and, and the operators of these reactors, you know, what, what's the level of safety? So some kind of notification system. There is an official notification system uh, that happens, but it's a very slow system uh, that takes a lot of time for, the, for it to get out. They have so many minutes or hours before they have to notify the national government. If you remember, at Three Mile Island, how did the people find out about Three Mile Island? Do you remember how that happened? A reporter intercepted a walkie-talkie signal, a, 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 a one of those portable radio signals, and heard the operators talking about something wrong in the plant. That's how the public found out about Three Mile Island. How did they, how do, you know, what about Chernobyl? It took us two or three days, and it didn't come from the operator, it came from another nation that they were, Sweden, who, who was seeing high levels of radioactivity, right? So that causes, in, in the Three Mile Island case, there was a lot of public angst because of the, the unknown. So you want a faster notification system. Remember I talked about the speed of the response, the speed of the, so you need a faster notification system to the people from the authorities so that they know what's going on. In today's age, modern age of technology, it's just gotta be faster. Because the press people, they're, they're really fast. Well, thank you. Thank you, that, um Compliment right at the end. Yeah, I had to do um, that. Because I, 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 I got to try to get out of this room. Right. <laughs> well, we'll just hold you for a little bit longer. Thank okay. you very much for thank that, you. your thank lively you. responses. All right. um, if folks want to hear more from Dr. Castro, he's actually uh, speaking at Temple University tonight at 7.30 p.m. In Tokyo and University uh, tomorrow. And Tokyo University tomorrow. tomorrow. Uh, it's at the fifth floor of Meter Hall tonight. Have I got that right, Carl? Um, and there's one thing left for me to do, and that is to give you an honorary year's membership Ooh. of our club. Ooh. So we hope we hope that you'll come back and speak to us again. Here's a Thank little token of my appreciation for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, sir. Very interesting.